Boom. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jason Burmis. I am joined by Jeffrey Wilson, Pat Militich, and Luca, I will butcher your name. <laughs> so we'll leave it to him to tell you. We're live over at the uh, the Militich residence to talk COVID-1984, to talk about what you did yesterday, Pat, which was huge. You know, you're the first sporting event, combat sports event to have thousands of people come out, have a good time. Doesn't have to be a media sanctioned protest for us to be safe. Right. And I mean, talk about diversity. There were people of every color, every race, every creed there enjoying themselves, having a good time. How did you, I mean, I know you were a big push for this. How did you get to put this on? You know, I think it comes down to our governor, Kim Reynolds, who is a forward thinker, definitely, you know, and it, ironically, like right now, the two best governors, and I'm not saying that like they're an exception, but I'm just saying it takes two women in this country to like lead the way in South Dakota and, and Iowa as the governors who are the ones opening up their state, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's, it's incredible. They're both uh, very good governors. And no matter what people think uh, about COVID or anything else, uh, I think they recognize more than anything else that, that this is all just dog training 101, conditioning with masks and social distancing and all the other garbage. And there's so many millions of people that are buying it that it's it's troubling it's it's flat out troubling it is and you know even the commissioner right so i got there at like four o'clock and they set up a nice little press table for me and there was one commissioner didn't have a mask on got into the ring you know checked out the ropes did his thing left and then another commissioner comes up probably half hour before the event 5 30 full-on mask he wants to know where the weigh-ins are going on doesn't even realize the weigh-ins happened yesterday seems all concerned i saw him with the mask on three quarters of the time right. lecturing the ring card girls i mean complete insanity and total dog training as if him wearing the mask and you know authoritatively dictating to people where they should stand or how close they should be made any difference whatsoever <laughs> about anything I mean, let's let's speak to that. You can have together. You can kiss my ass flat out. That every American out there who has to take care of children, uh, especially those that have children, we're essential. We're essential to our kids. And frankly, no government official has the right, the constitutional right, to lock down anything. And if the if the American people fall for it again, because they're going to try it again in the fall or the winter, uh, you're you're. I'm sorry. You're you're such. You're so gullible. It's 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 dangerous. Right now, just I, I've been staying in. Uh, explain your history a little bit, Luca. My history a little bit. So, so I, I am an immigrant uh, from Poland. Um, basically, I came here when I was uh, fairly young. Spent nine months in a refugee camp before coming to the uh, United States. And uh, my uh, grandfather worked for the Communist Party. So I remember being a, a kid and having you know German shepherds and Dobermans at the house that they would bring their police dogs in. My dad was incarcerated because of them. So it caused a bit of a, a strife in the family. And of course, I didn't meet my dad until I was about 13 years old, and that was in America already. Um, I've seen everything from, you know, socialism to communism to, uh, I, I still go to Cuba two to three times a year. I've been to Cuba three times and um, I end up taking shoes down there for people. And I still run into people here and they say, well, isn't the, the healthcare system there free and, and all this other stuff? And it's like, well, yeah, it's free, but how good do you think it is when, you know, they don't have aspirin or tampons or, or toothbrushes or toothpaste or anything? How good can the post-operative care be? And I'm so much less concerned with what people are saying and, and actually what people are doing. And, Bernie Sam Sanders is a great example. I mean, we had a heart attack and whatever else. His little Learjet could have taken him anywhere. Why didn't you go to Cuba and get operated on him? It's free, right? You could have been down there. It takes just as long to fly there as it does to Miami. Right. It's probably even a, a you know a faster landing pattern, if nothing else. So you have all these people, and, and it's like you know I've gone to Europe, and um, I, like I said, I travel to third world countries. I've been to uh, 37 countries, and I, I try to travel to three new countries every year. And I'm so amazed though, is and I talk to people that are very liberal and they love the idea of socialism. And I asked them, I said, listen. You know, we had in Michigan 140,000 people that were, were going two months without unemployment. The telephones didn't work. The, the unemployment system didn't work. And you want to put these people now in care of your health, right. of your surgeries? It's like, if you can't mow my damn lawn for 20 bucks correctly, I'm certainly not going to hire you for three grand to do my roof. <laughs> it's not something I would do, right? right? You have to be able to handle the small things before you can move on to larger things. And the closest thing that we have to socialize in medicine today in the United States is the VA. And we're dealing with 22 to 28 suicides a day from veterans. Right. Well, maybe that's part of the plan and not having to pay them their benefits, quite honestly. But when you take that and you uh, 
you know, apply the Pareto distribution that suggests, you know, if you have a company that's producing a thousand cars a day and let's say 10 come out incorrectly, it doesn't mean that a hundred would come out incorrectly if you were doing, you know, uh, let's say 10,000. Usually you'd have 500 to maybe a thousand that would come out because your mistakes get magnified as you keep producing things. Sure. Hmm. So during communism in Poland, it's, it's a funny thing. When you bought a car there, you would oftentimes get a stamp on when the car was produced. Let's say the company, let's say uh, Lada, let's say Zapolzets, one of those uh, auto manufacturers from Russia that got eight miles to the gallon but didn't go over 50 miles an hour. <laughs> let's say they, um, you know, let's say they had they had a quota of producing a thousand cars a month. Well, they would produce 200 the first three weeks and 800 the last week. And if you bought something produced the last week to meet that quota, you bought a lemon essentially. I mean, you hear these stories of windshield wipers being on the inside of the car. So somebody had the <laughs> windshield wiper there and the, the the windshield on the outside of it. So. I, I see these examples with people and it's like, you know, instead of 22 veterans a day, let's apply the same system that's not working for veterans right now, which is, is a very small minority of the population, and let's apply it and say everybody had that system where you're going to make even greater, graver mistakes and you're going to have maybe 800 suicides a day. Is that something that people are going to be happy with? Yeah, man. It's scary. It's like you've got to be able to handle the small things first before you tackle big things, right? Yeah. You've got to be able to go into the gym. You've got to be able to spar a guy for, you know, at least three to four rounds before you sign on to a 10-round, you know, fight that, that's three minutes around and whatever else. Sure. Um, and, and it just amazes mm -hmm. me. It's like the same people. And they're like, oh, oh, well, that's different. By the way, United States Post Office, they lost eight year, last year, $8 billion. So you want the same government agency that can't deliver a piece of paper and turn a profit to now handle my health care. And it's like people want to relinquish this control to people, and I'm just so amazed by it. It's like it doesn't seem like there's a lot of critical thinking behind it. It's just all emotion based. And it's like, well, that sounds great. Let's steal from you know all the millionaires and billionaires that actually create these companies. Well, it's like they take the risk, which is why they get the reward. They're the ones that you know open up a factory. They they you know hire a couple thousand people. They train them. Let's say they're producing pencils. You buy the lead, you know the wood, the 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 rubber, the the aluminum that goes on there, the coloring and everything like that. You know what's worth more? That company that actually employs people and buys the machinery and puts together a system and a distribution thing and invests all these millions before anything even gets distributed, or are you sitting on the side of the road with all these supplies with, with not the wherewithal to do anything with? Yeah. yeah. So this is the reason that America has done as well as it has. You have literally, it's, we're comprised of 196 different countries, and in that we have the greatest range. So we have certainly problems that exist here that are our own, that don't exist anywhere else because of that. Uh, because within that range of every single cultural group, you have, of course, uh, the range of how you feel about God, how do you see, feel about uh, bad things that happen, what your goals are for family, for marriage, what the family values are, all those things are encompassed in there. And it's like, we basically have an orchestra, and it's almost like infusing Middle Eastern instruments with quarter tones, and it's like, now make it work, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you're you're ready to go on stage, and here come five trombones and two ouds, you know what I mean, to play for you. And it's like, you know, we didn't even rehearse with these guys. So we are going to have issues, and we're all going to have problems, but um, one of the stories I shared earlier with you is, is one of the the things that had happened at this, um, uh, I, I want to say concentration, not concentration camp, but you know, refugee camp was, I remember these two kids, uh, one lady had a cat and these two kids, basically I think one was eight and the other one was six, they had beaten this cat to death. They had two sticks that they had gotten and they had just beaten this cat to death. And I remember not understanding the severity. And this is where you were for nine months. Nine months, right, in Austria. And like not far away from where Hitler's bunker was apparently, right? And not that I ever went to visit it, the, the, the lion's den or How old were you home. when you were there? Um, I was I was younger. I, I don't want to say about four or five years old. Okay. Yeah, be, okay. before going there. But there's still things that you remember. And it's like Thanksgiving I hate because we ate turkey every damn day for nine months, right? You know what <laughs> wow. I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, for some odd reason I like the turkey toms from, uh, you know, Jimmy John's. But I think those are like probably fake turkey or something. Like some <laughs> chicken, you know? That must be, you know, the, the selling point there. But it's like Thanksgiving comes around, we're cooking duck or geese at our house, right? Yeah. So, um, but I remember these two kids beating this this cat to death, and really, it's it's what it is is a, it's a manifestation of being frustrated at whatever system that you're not able to properly be able to speak about, and the anger that arises and comes out within, and it's a lot of what I see in modern day protesting in America. It's like there there's people who are angry, they may not necessarily know why they're angry, and it manifests itself in the destruction of people's property and other sorts of things. Because the easiest thing to do is always point at something, say why it's wrong, and try to tear it down. Right. The hard thing to do is to take something that's already in existence and try to prove upon it. That's the harder thing. That's the challenge. And I, I'm just amazed by people who want that challenge to happen externally. I mean, I've been supporting eight people directly through COVID-19 in Cuba and send, sending money there every month. And that's probably indirectly supporting 40 people that are down there, right? So I'm one person, and yet I'm helping maybe you know eight to forty people out and everything like that. I'm not waiting on a government policy to come in and fix things for me. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know you take the responsibility on yourself and you identify what the problem is. And and, and again, you know it's it's not by uh, 
you know, <clears throat> coincidence that, you know, you have these 450 pound pro feminists with pink hair that want to, you know, save the whales and save the planet. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, sweetheart, you might want to save yourself first before you have a heart attack at 32, you know? Um, there's a reason those things happen, right? Because it's the, it's the pseudo caring that people can essentially apply to different parts of their lives without having to do much work on themselves. Well, I mean, it's like the Jordan Peterson, you know, make your own bed first. And I always, I always have hashtag be your own hero, right? It's great to have heroes. It's great to look up to people. It's great to say, I want to attain that too. Sure. And people give you that path. But the bottom line is if you don't step up and do it, you don't step up and right. do it. Right. So if you're not willing to take those steps, and we were talking about cancel culture earlier, and we were talking about the destruction of these statues, and you were like, you know what? Some of these statues probably do have to go, but let's do it the right way, and let's not forget our history. You know, I get it. I don't like Albert Pike either, right. but I also don't like a mob tearing him down, setting him on fire with carte blanche, and then the next person <laughs> they come for is Teddy Roosevelt, the trust buster. The guy who had the first black man uh, to sit and have dinner at the White House. The first guy to have uh, a third party run for president under the Bull Moose Party. That's a huge part of our history. Sure. Are we going to cancel uh, Night at the Museum next and Robin Williams' performance as that right, statue? Right. Well, the problem is, I think the problem is, is when you mentioned manifestations of anger and all this stuff and the riots and stuff. Um, it's, it's unfortunately, you know, it obviously dawned on me pretty early that we've got um, millennials who have been conditioned for safe spaces and all this other garbage that is that they've been conditioned to deal with and now they basically through this COVID lockdown and all this other stuff and social distancing they gave us all a safe space right and we've literally got rioters that are in their 20s that's most of the crowd who are destroying stuff that have no clue of history no bearing on history and no understanding of that they're being used and weaponized to destroy their own nation so that socialists can come in and take over. And for the people that think that, that COVID-19, look, our prayers go out to anybody that has, has uh, had a loved one die of this, but we were following the bank implosion for over a year and telling you, I even said it on numerous podcasts that we did, episodes, and said, it's going to happen in the spring of 2020. And at the same time, we were having Diliana Gatun Shaiva on our show, talking about the numerous um, bioweapons labs that Western nations have and that they're weaponizing viruses and everything else. And that's not to say that this certainly came from, from a lab. It most likely did. But the point is, is that you idiots aren't paying attention to the fact that the middle class has just been thrown into abject poverty and it hasn't even hit yet. But when it does, and you're chasing your cat around with a knife because you're starving, you're going to understand, unfortunately. So that's 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 the, the madness. And all these people, when we talk about Michael Nunn and I doing our fight last night and having thousands of people there, and then the Quad City Times covers it, and people comment on the article that they posted on their Facebook page, saying, oh my God, these people, there's no social distancing, and there's no this, and there's no that. At what point did your life become more important than the history or the, the freedom of this nation and the freedom of our children, of what is coming down the pipe for you. The you point, these people are insane. It happens at the point that you put complete you know trust in government. And I warn people oftentimes, be very careful if you're trying to apply today's standards to people in our historical past. Because the truth is, if that's the case, probably you've no, grown up with rapists around and you probably called them grandpa. And the reason I say that is because the first year in the United States where a woman had taken her husband to court for, uh, I think it's like, uh, you know, unwanted spousal sex or whatever else was 1974. Before that, in the 50s and 60s, you, know, you could have your you know, wife committed or, you know, a van would drive by and they just give her a lobotomy to be happier, right? Be very careful on how you start applying these things because now it's like, you know, who are the next people that artist-wise we're not going to like anymore? Because, you know, Renoir, Degas, you know, Picasso... Dolly, are those all people that are going to get burnt in the future? Well, why wouldn't they? I mean, if statues are going down now, why, why aren't other things going sure. down? You want to remove statues from public places? I'm in favor of that. Put it in a museum somewhere, maybe even make it next to the museum where, where they talk about slavery in the United States. That's part of our history for better or for worse, right? Yeah. And every time people want to shy away from it, and it's this cancel culture where people have sort of grown up, and it's like, well, if I don't like something, then, then it must be wrong or, or whatever else. And it's like, well, I know people that are offended all the time by certain <laughs> things. And again, they, they, they have, if you look at them, they've got about 20 other issues that I would think are far more pertinent for them to fix than all the other sorts of things that they're looking at fixing. Right, right. So, uh, you know, it, it's a very strange time that, that people are in. And, you know, you go through, and, and Mahatma Gandhi, his statue was, uh, you know, I mean, he, he was the predecessor to Martin Luther King Jr. 
And when you think about it, nonviolent protest really only works when you're getting your ass beat. The moment that you fight back, now, you know, the damage that's done in a city from a speaker coming in there or somebody else, well, it's on both of you now, right? Fastest way to defuse something you don't like, don't show up for it, and don't counter protest to it if you don't like it. It's very simple. You don't are afraid of COVID, stay home if you want to. You take your precautions and whatever. Sure. Else. You're the one that has your house. By the way, 80,000 people right now, you talk about the middle class getting hit. 80,000 people right now that they're suspecting in, in the state of Michigan, this was from about 10 days ago, that um, they're, they're not allowing anybody to be evicted from their households. So people have sat there for four to six months, not paid rent, and a lot of them trashed the places. And I'm talking about, I know a few renters like, you know, essentially people chewing tobacco and speaking on the carpets on the floor. And by the way, these renters, when they get evicted, have to go somewhere else. I don't know where they're going to go when the other, you know, 79,909 apartments that they could potentially move into have been damaged. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, uh, there's going to be so many homeless from this. I mean, millions, potentially, right? Millions of homeless, uh, defaults on mortgages, <clears throat> businesses going under, you know, suicide rates are through the roof. Absolutely. You know, Overdoses are through the roof. Yes. All those, yeah. Domestic yeah. violence. Addiction, depression, everything. Well, what's it say about a country that, you know, <laughs> I can't get a pistol permit in New York. I couldn't even register my car until mid-June in which I had to write up the paperwork and literally put in a blank check, put it in a drop box, and hope that I would get that, right? But I get a Big Mac delivered tomorrow. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like right now, DoorDash, no problem. I don't understand what the difference is or what the mm -hmm. disconnect is. And when you talk about property owners and you talk about people with their mortgages and you talk about those small business owners, a lot of these are the cash businesses, right? That they know that some of them are skimming a little off the taxes. They don't like that. They want full taxation, full control, and it is those mid-level restaurants. Okay, you got a restaurant, 50% capacity max. We're going to give you authoritarian orders that will selectively enforce because there's no way anybody can actually go by them of six feet apart right. or, you know, sitting down and everybody's going to put a mask on to go to the bathroom and they're going to take it off. And so, yeah, exactly. It's clown world. But if they want to, say, take out a certain pizza place or a bar, all they have to do is go in, health code, boom, you're done. You're done. The other guy gets to stay. I drive by Dunkin' Donuts on the way here, right, to grab a coffee. And, of course, the front door is uh, locked, and, you know, the drive through is there. And it says on there, you know, you can download our app and pay, and then there's no contact. Well, how the hell am I getting my stuff? Is it transported <laughs> in the car? Somebody still made the it's damn teleported. donut. It's somebody teleported. crazed it. Somebody mixed the stuff for it. Somebody put it in the damn box. Somebody handed it to me. Somebody uh, there is by the ice machine pouring it into the thing. I mean, what am I talking to, a robot right. or something like that that's verifying the, or the order? So it's, it's just... How selective it is, is absolutely crazy. And I've seen in the media, it's like, well, if you're protesting, you're okay, but if you go to an event, you know, you're, you're wrong. If you go to a shop, you're wrong. I mean, Walmarts are open. They deal with how many thousands of people? Every one of those thousands of people throughout the day, I mean, when you think about the average order, let's say there's 20 people that go through a line in an hour, right? And that woman is working on an eight hour shift and everything like that. I got at least 160 people that I'm going with and talking to that mm -hmm. she's in direct contact with, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but I'm supposed to worry when I go and fill my, you know, gas in my car? Well, even when I go and purchase something at a store, right? Right. Now, um, Illinois and Iowa, I've been here now like three, four days. So, I feel like the corporation pushback now is maybe worse than the government pushback. Mandated in Walmart. I yeah. walk into a Marshalls to go get a belt, and they say it's mandated. I get in there. I got the stupid thing over my face on my rate. I take two feet in. Three quarters of the people aren't wearing masks. I immediately, immediately take it off. You know, I'm like, all right, well, I'm done with this, too. Right. Then I'm going up to pay you for my thing. You even go in there? Oh, it, 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 <laughs> listen, my belt broke as I sat down yesterday. I had to go buy another one, and there were 40 bucks at JCPenney that also wanted me to wear a mask. I told you to wear those damn hot dogs. <laughs> uh, you're not wrong. You know? <laughs> so my belt popped. I had to go in. I was irate. I did it anyway. But then I'm thinking to myself, all right, this person's checking somebody out. And then the spray can comes out. This hand sanitizer comes out. They've already said now two weeks ago it's not lasting on surfaces. Remember they tried to, it could be on surfaces for 14 to 17 right, days. Right. They don't want to talk about how many people are asymptomatic. Pat, you popped for the antibodies. Right. And, I mean, did you even know you had it? Oh, I was, yeah, I was sick in January. I was definitely sick. My kids coughed a little bit. My wife coughed a little bit. Um, a lot of the guys from my crew, we, we got it. And, and that's why I knew the 14-day incubation period. Um... Uh, the 14 day incubation period was complete garbage because we flew, everybody from my crew flew into New Mexico, Albuquerque. We flew in on Thursday, did the show on Friday night, flew home on Saturday, and by Sunday afternoon, all of us were sick. Everybody. 
going, my God, what did we catch? What did we catch? And I had it for two weeks. And uh, my lungs sounded like two bowls of soup. Literally. I, it was gurgling every time I breathed. So um, I, I just knew when, when they announced COVID and the lockdown, I went, I had it. I knew I had it. I, I knew 100%. And everybody on our podcast or, or people would comment and go, oh, yeah, tinfoil hat wear. Let me see the test. Let me see the test. Let me see the test. I can diagnose things pretty well. I'm not a doctor, but I've seen a lot of damaged bodies over the years. And I can I can go, it's your ACL. It's your MCL or your LCL. You know, uh, you pop the capsule in your elbow or whatever, right? Uh, it's like my wife used to get mad at me. She's a chiropractor. And I go, man, it feels like C6, C7's out. She goes, oh, you're a doctor now. I go, no, but um, good doctors listen to their patients. And she used to get so mad at me. But that, that was the thing. And so I went and got the test done, and I tested positive for... For the antibodies, right? And I went and I held it up on the screen of my podcast and went, Jeffrey and I, and I go, see, positive, thank you. Um, so yeah, I and, and they didn't tell any, tens of millions of Americans had it November, December, January before they even announced it. But Cuomo will tell you it came from Europe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah exactly. And that's the other thing. The media is still in denial about that fact that we we had cases November, I would say latest at this point, maybe even before then, yeah, right? Yeah, right. And Number one, the tests are flawed. We all know that as well, right? And you're only really able to find out via antibodies afterwards or if somebody's bad enough where they look at your lungs and it almost looks like a cystic fibrosis after the fact, after you've had this bad thing. Yet, they're talking about a vaccine not just one time, but now seasonal like the flu, when their own influenza A and B, by the CDC's own numbers this year for the 2019-2020... They say it every year! ...is at a 47% <laughs> effectiveness rate. That's their max they can claim. Influenza A and B. B is H1N1, the swine flu that they scared the shit out of everybody in 2009 with, 37% effective. So now I'm rolling the dice on something that might work one-third of the time... And what's in it? Not only what's in it, but what chances did I have to get the flu? 5 to 10%? So you're saying, oh, maybe there's a one-third chance it gets cut down to 2.5 to right, 5%? Right. That's complete insanity, yet they're saying you need an immunity passport? Uh, just sitting here in Iowa, I'm supposed to quarantine myself for 14 days when I get back home to New York? Not going to happen. Cuomo and Bloomberg, come on to my house. Tell me to stay there. We'll see what happens. Okay, don't bring your bodyguards. Like, do it. Well, I'd love to see it. Yeah, the guy, the guy that, the guy that sent... Uh um, all, the, all the infected patients in the nursing homes to just uh, devastate and annihilate the elderly in the nursing homes, right? These guys are criminals. They're yeah. flat-out criminals. But you know, as far as every flu season, I, I try to tell people, and I want people to start paying attention to this, because I pay attention to it, and I say it every year. I, I go, oh, here we go. Got to get your flu shot. Got to get your flu shot. Got to get your flu shot. And I said, in five months, they're going to say, it wasn't effective. It wasn't effective. It wasn't effective. Every single year, it's the same, and you're too stupid to remember from last year that they're going to do it again this year. So just, hey, let's pay attention this time. And when they say, you got to get your flu shot, go ahead and sit this one out because in about four or five months, they're going to go, oh, yeah, it wasn't the right combo because that was the flu from last year and the year before that, and we figured we might be able to get it, but it wasn't. Yeah, it didn't work. Well, you look. I was in the military. Now I'm a veteran. Uh, seven years, United States Air Force. I mean, over there, you'd get shot up with stuff, and you had to go and get all, you know, anthrax vaccines and flu vaccines and everything else. And twice in seven years, I ended up getting the flu with getting all the shots. You know that they had, had given me, and half the time you wouldn't even know what it was. Anthrax, you knew because it would form a gel under your skin. You had to run for 24 hours for it to disappear, right? So that one you knew. It's like I almost would rather get the damn anthrax in the letter in, in the mail, right? So I could open it at my leisure. Um, twice in seven years, I got it. Since I've been out, it just reached around the 10-year mark. I've gotten the flu once, and I've never taken the, the vaccine for anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm against it. You know, I, I'm 100% I'm against it, not to mention when you find out, uh, you know, I have friends who are toxicologists, all the other things that are in there, yeah. from heavy metals to... to, to Thimerosal. Other. I mean, look, let's look at Fauci himself, right? Yeah. I, I call his lang language Faucian at this point, <laughs> because it is very Faucian. Every time he gets called out on something, he either tends to agree or lies through his teeth. So uh, one gentleman, Democrat, by the way, to his uh, credit, not Rand Paul. Rand Paul also challenged him on a bunch. Sure. He goes, well, why don't you let us know uh, how many vaccines actually make it to market? Fauci, an answer, well, more don't make it to market than do. He's like, it's about 6%, right? Yeah, that's accurate. So first he tries to deflect, make right. you think maybe it's 60-40, 70 30, 50-50. Right. No, it's 6%. Then the man brings up the fact that it's mutated. 
words out of Fauci mouth, that doesn't mean it changes. Uh, the definition of mutate has changed in it twice right. in an eight, uh, eight, eight word sentence. Okay, so yes, it has changed. That is what mutation means. So then he goes, well, it's not really viable for this vaccine because how long does it take on average for uh, a vaccine to be developed? Well, you know, it can vary on that. And he's like, seven years, right? And he's like, seven years is accurate. <laughs> so then he asks again, well, what's the quickest vaccine we've ever made? Now he wants to point to polio, but he has to point to Zika because they did that in under two years, but that just kind of disappeared. So what are we doing? <laughs> well, and again, we talked about, you know, the politicians we know have misguided us forever. But, you know, I missed the worldwide election that elected Bill Gates to be the head of our global policy or, or Dr. Fauci. I mean, granted, we elected these people in and they have to be held accountable. But what about these unelected bureaucrats and technocrats that are determining the path of the world? Well, let's talk about that. The because who? No, the leader of the leader of who? Who's the former health minister of Ethiopia, who was brought up on charges and taken to court for crimes against humanity for covering pandemics in his own nation. The man is a criminal, and he's being paid off by Gates to be a, 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 just a, a, a talking. A talking well, that, that's not even mentioned the other conflict of interest with Fauci, the Bill Gates, Melinda Gates Foundation, the patents that Fauci has on certain proteins related to the coronavirus. I mean, it's the books are so cooked, and I don't. I mean, again, we talked a little bit off air. The fact that they've pretty much decimated the middle class, these banks have gotten trillions of dollars to buy up everything, the pennies on the dollar, while you know you and I, just the regular Joe, just fights to survive over something that 99.7% of the people survive. You know, we were talking about pneumonia deaths and other influenza deaths. You know, hey, we don't we don't shut everything down because of that with higher higher mortality rates. But yeah. for some reason, this go through we the shut history. Down the world. Yeah, go through the history of pandemics. We did it on a show a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, a long time ago. And the I mean, you know, you look at uh, pandemic averages for the like the top ten. And we're talking like five million wiped out, all the way up to five hundred million people. Um, this one has one hundred and twenty thousand, around one hundred and twenty thousand so far in the United States. And yet, 800,000 children, I mentioned it last night, 800,000 children a year go missing in this country, and the media never even talks about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason they don't talk about it, because they're farming these kids, the organ trafficking, the sex trafficking, and all the other stuff that's going on, and they refuse to cover it. The citizens better wake up and, and, and understand that it's us versus the elites. It's not left versus right. It's none of that, man. It's the bankers, the politician puppets, and the, pe the people that control all of it above them, um, you know, the Kissingers and, and the Soroses and these kind of guys that run that left-right right, the, yeah. the left -right paradigm, that's all this is. And everybody buys into the left-right paradigm and has us wanting to fight each other for what reason? Well, and it goes, it goes to what we've talked about the longer game, you know, with China being kind of the beta test or the test model for the social credit score. If you don't do this, you can't ride public transportation. We're starting to see the infant stages of that. What, you don't have your mask on? You can't shop at the store. Right. You can't go to this baseball game. Your kid can't go to school. So, again, this is a huge larger game of, in my opinion, a eugenics technocratic plan that they formulated years ago that we're now starting to see implemented to the point where I've said over and over again, they have to take out the old to bring in the new, whether it's people, uh, politically, socially, monetarily. We're about to see the end of the dollar we see down in St. Louis. You have to have the right change or you have to use credit. They're basically going to move towards a digital currency and get rid of fiat currency. I mean, this is all, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. We are in the infant stages of a much larger chess game. And we oftentimes are just so busy reacting day to day on who did what, what's going on, to really kind of understand and comprehend, again, this larger grand chessboard to steal a line from Zbigniew Brzezinski that they've had mapped out. You know, we're getting into this language of sustainable development, the new normal, Agenda 21. This is a chess game. So people, put your checker pieces away, baby. This is some long game stuff. I'm actually glad you mentioned China. China has a system in place, and it's been in place for about the last four or five years, where they have a, a certain monitoring device on people who are, for example, if they're compatible and fall into line, they, when they buy airline tickets, they pay cheaper prices. They wait in line less when they go to some, like the equivalent of Secretary of State to handle IDs and whatever else. And what you see is people there will set up situations where somebody loses their dog and somebody finds their dog, and so they get these little brownie points, right? And they do it on purpose. It's like friends do it in between friends to try to manipulate the system. Mm. So it, it's really controlling the individual through the ability of every, I mean, if 
for example, we considered you to be a good citizen, right? Meritocracy. Because you pay your taxes online and you buy a car that's, you know, a Prius so you can feel, you know, morally superior to the rest of us who might have an F-150 or whatever else, right? Well, then, you know, your internet costs 35 bucks a month and somebody else's, you know, costs 90 and, and they get half the speed or half the download capability. Mm -hmm. And there is that level. Now, the problem with attacking the middle class right now that traditionally um, America is still the easiest place to make something of yourself. And it's always been that way. And you have people that, you know, come here when they're in their 30s and, and, and mid 30s and they learn English and they become doctors, lawyers, pharmacists, other careers that they want to do. And yes, you're going to take money out and you're going to get, take loans on whatever else. And that's part of the trade off to it. And then hopefully you're going to work and you're going to pay those back because if it just came to you for free, you wouldn't really value it. And that's the same with most things, right? That, that go on in life. But it's just amazing to me because now when you're looking at it, well, you started decimating the middle class and those are the people that, for example, might own apartments or a second house that they rent out and you've got now these 80,000 renters that haven't been evicted and know they haven't been evicted so they've just been staying in their place for free and not paying the bills and so, in some cases the power company can't cut off the power and whatever else. Well, you're pushing the whole middle class into, again, the have-nots. So you're not bumping them. It, you know, it'd be one thing if you were bumping the middle class up a little bit when they were doing a little bit better, right? But when you're not doing that and you're forcing, I mean, it, it, it's like, well, well, what is the point? Well, you see the market oftentimes and it's like businesses go out and, and they crash. And, uh, you know, afterwards, the people with money that have cash in hand go in and buy those spots that they want to, right? And then a CVS opens up six months later or three years later, what have you, right? right. Provided it's not completely decimated and damaged. Yeah, I feel like it is. This is a consolidation of power by the predator class because just like you said the people that were in that middle class or upper middle class that had these businesses that maybe had a little cash on the side they're not making that then you had the people that weren't working or working jobs 40 hours maybe making four or five hundred dollars a week well you put in a system into place that they not only get that four or five hundred but another six hundred not to work and they hated their job anyway. You're preparing them for a universal basic income yeah. and the rise of the automation nation. The only nation. reason Andrew Yang ran was that, to plant the seed. That's, that's the only reason he ran. And that was my biggest it, issue with Tulsi was that she even endorsed that. You know, yeah. uh, that really bummed me out because I think that that's a really inhuman answer. I think that listen, I'm not an anti-technology guy. Without this, we wouldn't be doing it, right? right? But we have to find a way to work with technology. Technology is a tool just like a ha hammer, man. It can be used to empower or enslave. You can bash someone's head in with it, you can build a house. Well, it comes I want to build houses. It comes <laughs> with greater responsibility. It comes with, you know, I, I mean, when you're looking at right now, even, you know, I, I had done a film, by the way, when we talked about this cancel culture. It was Saganatic. It was the first film I had produced. And after a year, it got banned from Amazon Prime. So when you talk about it directly costing me money, because again, people it's like you know I, I read some of the reviews and people were like well I don't like this film because it's on addiction I hate addiction and it's like well no shit addiction exists and guess what so do flat tires and people's houses burning down and other sorts of things so does death and disease and it's like so just because you don't like something you're gonna shy away from it and you know I, I've I've heard uh, people come out and, and basically say it's like a lot of these one of the, the byproducts of people having more time to invest in their kids is that we've raised these beta males, right? Yeah. We've had these helicopter moms that have prevented their kid from ever falling off a bicycle or burning their <laughs> hand or bumping their head or doing whatever else that always prevented them from doing going out and doing the things that men do, that testosterone makes us do, right? That, that's that's the reason natural. We, the reason that we built <laughs> ships and you know sailed across countries yeah. and took over places and it wasn't always pretty and it, it still isn't going to be in the future. But that's the difference. And so we want to go through and pretend that everything is the same and it's just, you know, a societally created thing. And now we can't even agree in America from state to state what should be on school lunches. But yet somebody somewhere along the line put in a master plan that, you know, made women feminine, forget the fact that they give birth and everything like that, right? But, but made women, you know, the way that they are and there's no difference between the gen genders except what society created. Except for that Y chromosome. Right. You know, you, yeah. can, you just can't replace that. Pesky thing. That's that pesky Y chromosome. I, I was in Alaska last year. In Alaska, the totem poles, I didn't know this. This is just another additional fact. They would have women chew the salmon eggs to, because they had a certain uh, uh, enzyme that actually helps the paint coagulate and come together to, to paint these things. So the women were the paint mixers chewing on it, right? I mean, did they develop this extra enzyme because they played with Barbie instead of G.I. Joe? No. No. They get some of the dumbest, most nonsensical shit, and then, of course, you get a degree in pH studies and everything like that. It's like, okay, you just told me you might not even be able to run a coffee machine. You know what I mean? Doctorate in gender studies. You know what I mean? Oh, dude. Holy hell is that useless. Well, I'll tell you what. So that's big where I am right now. Um, so I live in a college town, and 
Who knows where it's going because they've already done the social distancing. They put in all sorts of draconian rules for people to come on. About 80% of the students are going to have to go online anyway. But the thing is, there's nurses all around. Actually, that's where I got a lot of my medical connections down there because bartenders and nursing. But about four years ago, they started getting grants for the transgender surgeries. Okay, so now uh, Oneonta, New York is one of the biggest places, not only in the state, but in the country that you can go get the actual surgery. So now in my area, I, I have so many transgender post-op people walking around. And if you dare to speak out that maybe you shouldn't, you know, mutilate your genitals at 18 years old or even 21 and maybe you want to wait it out, I'm a bigot. Oh, I, I, well, there's a reason there's <laughs> massive suicide rates amongst these people. It's because 40%. they're so screwed up by yeah. whether it's the vaccines, right. the processed foods, right. the toxins that lower testosterone and make them that way to begin with, right? Monsanto's, uh, you know, uh, GMOs, and all G that. GMOs and everything else that have proven to, like, change the gender of frogs, right? <laughs> right. That's what's happening to these people. And then they're like, so they have no, they have no, uh, no testosterone coursing through their veins and feel like a man. So they're confused as shit. They have, uh, uh, you know, massive mental issues, and they end up committing suicide because of it. So I'm telling people, just literally, like, you got to figure this shit out because, like, yeah. I surgery part. doesn't seem like the answer for please, that, right? Please, no. please, no. please let me touch on this for a yeah. from the military perspective as well. They had in Lake Michigan, they found I think sturgeon, a male sturgeon that had eggs, and the reason is out of all the stuff that we filter out of water, one of the things we don't take out is estrogen, right? from women using birth control. And so the natural process of the world is that your body tries to counteract it. The same reason that a lot of, you know, uh, former bodybuilders who take a, took a bunch of testosterone, their bodies put estrogen in overdrive, and that's why they end up with these bitch titties after they stop lifting weights, right? What'd you call that? Bitch titties. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, gynomastia. Gyno gynomastia. Gynoclomastia. Okay. Gynoclomastia? Yeah. I thought it was gynomastia. Uh, either one. We'll bitch get a tits. doctor's clarification bitch tits. on that. <laughs> yeah. Get your wife out here to fix it for us, right? So, so she can fix this. By the way, for the longest time in the military, you go in and it works because you adjust to it, not it adjusts to you. The people that were coming in to the military that were transgender wanted demands such as going through, getting surgery, having the military pay for it, having a year off of work to transition into it, rechanging all the gender pronouns so it wouldn't be, you know, yes sir and no ma'am and whatever else. And by the way, some of them are gender fluid, so, you know, you can punch a guy in the head and a female is the one you knocked out, right, by the hit the ground if they, you know, didn't make up their mind. They're or non-binary. Yeah, non-binary, you know, they don't fit into everything. So it's like, you know, most you of the time, it. most of the time to prevent abuses in the military, what they would do is they would have, if they had male flights, usually had male MTIs and female flights would have female MTIs, right? Military training instructors or sure. instructors. And the reason being is to prevent the natural, you know, abuse that could happen, which still does happen, right? Yeah. So what are you going to do? Can you create a, a whole, like, all new uniforms and this and that? And by the way, tech school sometimes is two years long, right? And I didn't know this. One of the women when I was in Korea with had to have a breast reduction. Because of that, they had to detach the nipple, right, for her breasts. When they did that, she can't breastfeed. So when she got out, she got 100% disability, and she didn't even know it just because she came in with big breasts, right? So now these people are going to come in, lose their penis, or, 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 you know, lose their breasts and whatever else, and now they're going to come in, work for six months at their job if they show up because they may not feel like it, and then they're going to get out with 100% disability. That's not how the military works. You adjust to it, not it running mm. around trying to adjust to 80 damn people who can't make up their damn minds. Well, that's what they're doing. They're using the military as a social experiment instead of, it's a killing machine. That's what it's built for. Right. It's, There's it no works, room right. for the bullshit. Right. It's yeah. not It's not there for you to, well, I sort of feel like this. I don't give a shit how you feel. You know what I mean? You're this rank. You take orders and you do damn well what you're told to do. And that's how it works. And maybe you go up a rank so you can tell others what to do and you're in a position of leadership, right? right. The rate of suicidality stays the same and sometimes even increases after surgery. And by the way, there are people out there that want to, you know, have an arm cut off or a limb cut off. Those people, that's considered a mental defect. But a perfectly healthy penis or a pair of breasts, go ahead, right? Well, isn't it still gender dysmorphia? Doesn't the military still classify it as that, or they moved away now? I'm with not all sure of how it. the military classifies it. I, I, but you know, surgeons are going to ultimately perform whatever they get paid to do, right? They'll, and thank God, because some of these Brazilian women have the most wonderful looking asses in the world, right? And it might be from injections and they may leak, and you know what I mean, or whatever else, but they look great from afar, right? But there are certain surgeons that won't do the surgeries and other ones that will, right? Um, I'm reminding you of the Korean woman. I don't know if you ever saw the South Korean woman that was a fitness model, and she had gone through, I think, eight or 12 procedures, and Japanese doctors wanted to do no more, so she literally took oil and injected it into her face, right? 
I mean, have you guys heard of this or not? No. Uh, well, we'll look it up afterwards. I mean, she looks like a damn, like a, a bad embalming job after 20 years is what she looks like, right? And it, it, it's like, I, I get where the, the reason that people that have had disorders, and I'm not against transgender people, but the point is because the rate of suicidality stays the same, it tells me that the external fix is not fixing the problem. Mm -hmm. We didn't help schizophrenics out. We didn't help other people that have other issues out by pretending that, you know, George Bush is talking through them through the TV, through a Russian mobster and whatever else, and they have to go and kidnap Robert De Niro in order to complete some mission. We did it through finding medications that hopefully gave him a quality of life later down. And just because, uh, and I'm, I'm sure there's people that might feel that they don't belong in that body, right? Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that you automatically belong in the next body. Well, the thing is that we all have things about ourselves that we want to change, right? I wish I was 6'5 and dunking a basketball. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, all of us have certain aspects of our physicalities that we wish we could improve. Some of them we actually can. A lot of it's through hard work. Sure. You know, Pat here is a 52-year-old man. He's in much better shape than I am. He's in incredible shape. Absolutely. That's not easy. Right. You know, you got to work at that. And I feel like so many people want to take the easy way out. They feel like they've gotten this attention, they've never had this much attention before, and then they decide to make that leap not knowing where they're going and saying, this is going to change me for the better, I'm going to feel better. But that internal struggle is never going away, it doesn't matter. And the thing is, I don't care who you sleep with, as long as you're an adult and it's another adult, I don't care. Well, I don't you know, care. I, it, doesn't, I don't... it doesn't bother me. I'm just warning these people that you are physically changing yourself beyond repair. It's not just a bad nose job. It's not just your cheekbones. These are your sexual organs. And I think there's something to be said about those people that get plastic surgery until the day they die. They've never been happy with but themselves. But let's be honest, fake breasts are pretty awesome. <laughs> now, listen, I don't, I don't, I've I don't had a couple good ones. Yeah. I, 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 I'm I, usually I, a fan oh, of the you, naturals. You used to have, Oh, yeah, used to have, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've done a few wrestling moves on some tied-down women, bounced off, and almost got seriously injured, right? They're not always great, right? They have a level of elasticity that should always be there. Um, yeah, it, it, it can be quite problematic. Um, when, I just lost my train of thought. What, what's up, something you just yeah, said a bit ago, how we treat, you know, from a psychological standpoint, yeah. you know, we treated schizophrenics with, with medicine and therapy, etc. I told my daughter, you know, my 12-year-old daughter, she's like, what's, you know, I identify as XYZ. Back in my day, I identify as the second coming of Jesus Christ. I am Jesus Christ. Right. We dealt with those people psychologically. We didn't say like, hey, here he is, Jesus. And then the next one comes along. You can identify you're, you're, as you're Jesus too? <laughs> How many of you guys are going to identify as Jesus and let's take you fucking seriously? So, right. I mean, again, there is such a huge, I think, psychological component of this that, you know, I'm no doctor or any of that kind of shit, but it's just... I wouldn't like. I don't know if I'd use normalize, but it's just it is kind of weird how we've normalized these kind of psychological conditions and like almost with the military expect the whole world to kind of readapt to your mental disorder, your mental issues. What I see is a slowed up Darwinism, and what I mean when I say that is we have made life so comfortable for people. When you think about it, you have padded playgrounds now, right, where you can fall, you know, twelve or thirteen feet, and it's like, hey, Timothy, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You know what I mean? He climbs back up and bounces off again. Right. Doesn't break a bone, right? Well, these people are not going to procreate. They're not going to have offspring because we've created life that's so comfortable for them that they can live that fantasy life for however many years they want to, essentially, right? And in the end, it's like, well, that group keeps, keeps getting smaller and smaller. And the people that sit there and believe, you know, in, in getting abortions, that group gets smaller and smaller, right? So you eventually, with that mentality, weed yourself out. It's just the fact that you might be here for 80 to 90 years right. with that mentality right. because life's been made so comfortable. Right? It's not like World War II where, you know, I mean, hell, the, the first people that a lot of people don't know this, but that Hitler started out with was where people that he looked at that were living off the state because they, they had a, a, a disability, right? So they had vans that they would drive to people's homes and tell them that they're, you know, put the Red Cross on them and put them in there and just run the exhaust pipe into the van. Mm. An hour and a half later, you know, they were dead and that was it. That was one way of them saving money. Right? No, you're right. Right. Yeah. Well, so, think about think about that. So let's go to this. I want to transition because that was perfect. Um, so we've got Antifa and Black Lives Matter. We know uh, both have been weaponized. Um, look, there's a lot of people involved in Black Lives Matter who just want justice. They just want the justice system to be fixed. Right. Uh, you know, and at the same time, you know, you, you have to understand history that Biden was the guy in the Clinton administration and, and you know, that, that, pushed, yeah. that pushed the crime bill that put millions upon millions of black men in prison for minor drug offenses, right? And and that that that's something that at least Trump, you know, got a, a mass of them uh, released uh, because he knew it was bullshit. So that's one good thing I'll say about Trump. But you know, that Antifa and Black Lives Matter, the people that are the organizers for this, that are being paid, 
to do all of this stuff, um, and Jeff will talk about it, I'll let Jeff elaborate, is that, you know, you go back to the to the different Bolshevik revolutions, the Nazi takeover, you know, the Pol Pots, all that. The process was remove law enforcement, which they're in the process of doing now, right. uh, taking away authority, taking away money, getting rid of good cops, don't even want to be cops anymore because of the bullshit they're dealing they're with. retiring in mass numbers. Right, right, yeah. from society side and from uh, city councils and mayors, the lunatics, the Marxists in, in control and power. But in history, the brown shirts, you know, when while the brown shirts were out terrorizing German citizens and murdering people and doing all this other stuff because they were the prisoners that were let out of prison, i.e. what we're doing now again, um, that once their job was done, while the brown shirts were out running around doing all that, Hitler was building the SS, and then once the brown shirts were done, the SS lined them up on walls and shot all of them. So the, the idiots in Antifa and the leaders of Black Lives Matter have the same fate coming for them. Oh, absolutely. That they don't Useful understand idiots. this. Absolutely. Well, again, I'm sorry, but going back to what we were saying about kind of the infantile thought process of this generation of kids who've never had their ass whooped and they get a participation trophy for sucking, you go out and you see some of these people, you know, someone trying to drive home with their daughter in their car, a loved one in the car, and these people stop them on the street, and even if you creep up a little bit, they swarm you, and the moment you get out to try to protect yourself, they cry like little bitches. They've lived in this world of absolutely no accountability that they think they can go out accost people declaring their their intentions of burning this down and fucking taking what's ours and when people actually fight back and defend themselves they have the nerve to like snap you fascist pig you blah blah blah, blah because you're defending themselves well it's like the antifa guy in you know, i think it was seattle um who opened the black dude's car door yes, that's a perfect and, to attack him and the black dude got out picked him he literally choke slammed him yeah picked him up by his neck and dumped him on his back and said don't you ever Ever touch my vehicle again? Yeah, ever. Door, and look right? at that reaction. They were like, "There was the basketball player." Oh yeah, right? they're all filming him and all oh, this. They're like, "How stuff. dare you? How, he get him? He's got bows and arrows in his car." So then they yeah. swarmed him once he defended himself. I saw the post on that made by a liberal, and of course it said on there, "It's like, oh, you know, this guy looked like he was passing on his car. We were just checking up on him Fuck and stuff like that." that. You uh-huh. want to check up? You knock lightly on the damn door if you want to, and that person has the ability. You, know, you go up and you open some stuff. I mean, that guy got you what he deserved and not enough. Yeah, you open my car door, you're going to have serious issues. <laughs> like, you're all going to the this hospital. That's why I never opened the door for you anywhere to go. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the anyway. No, they're all going to the hospital. <laughs> all of them. Well, it speaks to the fact of you never getting your ass kicked, right? I think right. a lot of us, at least me, I learned life's not always fair. Sometimes the bully wins. And you got to know your your situations. You got to understand. Okay, well, maybe I have to learn to defend myself, right. or maybe I'm not going to pick on this guy. It's the same thing with sports. And we're talking about participation trophies. You know, I feel like they've demonized sports more and more over the last 20 years. When sports are so important out, outside of just the athletics, because you end up on a team, you're outside of your social circles that you've created, and you might hate the guy next to you, but he's the one hitting home runs. And you need him. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there's this camaraderie that kind of builds you for the real world that you're going to have to work with well, people think about you don't this. like. Yeah, and when you mention sports, think about this. And a, a politician, Neil Anderson, who's an Illinois uh, senator, um, he's been on our show before. He's a great guy. He's a stand-up guy. He's a fireman also. Uh, legit, like a legit guy. And Jeff will agree 100% on this. He sent me a text uh, this morning that said, basically, you know what, man? The message that you sent was clear last night. He said, you know, a man, a white man versus a black man in, in the ring, right? Uh, American, American flag shorts, a Black Lives Matter shirt, you know, uh, fans of both colors on both sides, right? I had, I had black dudes going, military, you fucking rock, and he had white dudes saying the same thing to him, right? It was, it was about bringing people together, and he goes, and at the end, a black man and a white man giving each other a hug who still probably have differences, but you brought the community together to show that we can work together. And that's that was the whole point. That was the whole point. Me helping Michael Nunn take care of his family and him te- te- helping me take care of my family. We can work together. And the bullshit that we're seeing on the media and people buying into it is the most disturbing thing because they've gotten people to think with only emotion. No logic whatsoever. So all of these people, the millennials, are all based on emotion. And thinking with emotions is how you get people killed, including yourself. Because when you go into this rage and think you can burn shit and think you can come up in my car and burn it or attack my house or do whatever, that's how you end up dead. Like, dead. And and speaking to the larger chess game, once again, the divide and conquer has been a military tactic for eons. And again, we this is a large extent, a huge, very sophisticated psyop that you really have to just 
see through. And again, it's, it's a chess game, man. And throughout history, I know a lot of people didn't like history, but unfortunately, those are the people who are thinking like, wow, where's this coming from? Whereas I'm a history guy. I don't know who else is a history guy, but you see the patterns throughout history. So you begin to see, like Pat was saying earlier, this is Bolshevik Revolution 101 or Mao oh. Zedong, you know, releasing the prisoners, you know, it's the police having to resign. And again, you brown shirts, I know you think you're fucking Ralphie Wiggum and you're helping, but when they are done with you, they will be done away with you. And By you will way, just be a useful idiot. Speaking of Chairman Mao, and I, and I love that you brought him up, actually. When you look at the sheer numbers, what he did, if you take all the people Hitler killed, directly and indirectly, and all the people that Joseph Stalin killed, which was two and a half to three times more than Hitler, Mao Zedong has both of them beat by two and a half. And he was trying to help his people because he decided the best way for China to essentially move up in the world as, as a world economy is for people to, to essentially produce steel, right? So he took farmers, people that knew how to farm, and it's a very similar thing that the Bolsheviks also did. They went in and decided that somebody, even within one generation, if they were the farmers that actually knew how to farm, he, he said, oh, well, these are the bourgeoisie, right? So they sent them to the gulags and everything like that. And over the next two years, six million Ukrainians died. Not the, to mention the, the how many The kulakization. Right. Jordan Peterson has a great uh, video on that, the kulakization of the people who were pretty much responsible for the farming. And then when they were done with them, like you said, yeah. died by the millions in these Ukrainians. I Ukrainian just the walked... Uh, earlier this year, I think it was in February, before this whole thing kicked off, an older gentleman who was eight years old who got locked in to a gulag with his father because he didn't have a mother at home. He had uh, fought in World War II as a World War II veteran. His sister had been abducted, right? And uh, in some, in somewhere in North Africa, they never found out what happened. He was eight years old and he had to bury his dad. He, he pulled him out on a sled. He said he, he, you know, dug a hole two or three times and filled it with water. Finally, the third time, he just dumped his dad into it and covered it. Jesus. Right? And, and you want to talk about these young assholes in this country that have literally not dealt with shit, right? Have done nothing and don't know how to do anything. And so when they get out in the world now, they're 25 or 28 years old and they've gone through participation trophies. I mean, I mentioned the one fighter I brought to uh, the Mayweather boxing camp, right? Yeah. Getting ready for the Pacquiao fight. He brought his family here. And he had an eight-year-old son and his eight-year-old son had always trained with his dad, as I'm sure some of you, you know, your kids may sure. have seen, you know, you guys do. And um, so this kid was in better shape than a lot of the other kids. And one of his teachers once pulled him over. And I'm talking about, what, third or fourth grade or whatever grade it is. And he said, you know, you need to stop running so fast because you're making all the other kids feel uncomfortable, right? <laughs> so let's take everybody that's Down to good the lowest at common denominator, yeah. continuum. Yeah. Right. I mean, in another, you know, 10, 15 years, all we're going to have is the Special Olympics in America. Because yeah. anybody who's actually good at anything, we prevent them from moving further. Yeah. That's what's happening in public school systems. I've yeah. never in my life met two people who are equal. I am not even equal to myself from today and tomorrow. Right. I'm a little bit fatter. I might be a little bit more injured. I might be skinnier. I might have had a couple donuts. I might have COVID-19. I may not, right? I, I might have forgotten right. some things. I might have learned a couple things, right? So you, you, you put this stupid ideology into things that everybody's equal and everything's the same. The truth is nobody is. Not even up until themselves. I agree. Great I point. mean, we should all have the equal rights, right? That's what we should strive for. Every man, woman, created equal, equal rights in that sense. But to think that we're all as good as one another, absolutely not. And the thing is, you have to find your niche, and you may not even be the greatest at it. You work towards it. You know, you you, if you're not working towards anything, you're handed everything, and then you don't have a discernibility of reality, and you buy into this infotainment celebritard culture <laughs> where everything is about my selfie, my Snapchat, my Instagram, what I'm eating, who I'm hanging out with, how cool I can make everybody think I am, rather than producing something. And one of the reasons I do this, and I, you're a documentary filmmaker, yeah. I'm hoping my work outlasts me. Sure. You know, it, and that's it. And that it's whatever you build forward. And hopefully you build that with the family unit, your sons, your daughters, your nieces, your nephews, and show them the way that, hey, this isn't easy. None of us have beaten a Grim Reaper. We all go out at some point. What are you leaving for the next Unless generation? Unless we're on the Kings list. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, tell people, I tell people all the time, I say, keep writing your own eulogy. And I don't mean sit down every day and write about, oh, I wish they said this about me or whatever else keep doing stuff that's memorable so there's a bit of a legacy that you leave, right? Mm -hmm. I got diagnosed with cancer about three years ago, and it was single-handedly the most positive single experience I've ever had happen. Being diagnosed life. with cancer three years ago was the most positive thing that ever most happened. Most positive thing. And not because my life's been miserable. It's not that. It's because it made me look at time differently. I know so many people, like, again, they have these pipe dreams. Well, when I'm 65, I'll travel America, right? Or when I'm 65, I'll go to Portugal. I always want to go to Portugal and stuff like that. It's like, well, you get diagnosed with cancer. You don't know if you have six months left to live. 
Are you going to die and are you going to die peaceably because you've done what you wanted to do? Well, the moral of the story is start doing what you want to do and don't wait to 65 when you, you know, when you can probably jump rope with your hemorrhoids at that age, right? <laughs> and you either have dementia or you have something else. So I've seen these people that get these, you know, placards, you know, 40 years at work, you know, never missed a day and whatever else. And two years later, they have dementia. They don't even know whose name is on that, right? Yeah. Go out and live that life. What is it that you want to do? And start slowly working towards that, you know? There's definitely homeless problems, right? There's homeless there's problems in a lot of areas. There's problems with work. It's like, well, the easy thing to do is sit there and complain about it. The hard thing to do, perhaps, would be take out a loan, develop an apartment complex, make low-income housing for some people, take somebody in if you want to. Guess what? Open a cafe, hire some people, help them get off their feet in some sort of way, right? Yeah, yeah. But that takes work. Not sitting there pointing your little fucking finger and talking about how messed up everything is. That's the easy thing. Mm -hmm. That is the easy thing. And once you accept that of sitting back and essentially waiting for things to happen to you, you're not really that far off from a barn animal that you go out and you feed every day. Your pasture is there, you become accustomed to it. Sometimes there's food and sometimes there isn't. And maybe if there isn't, you look around and you say, well, a lot of other people are starving too, right? Mm -hmm. But we've literally raised this generation of people. And I think some of it has to do with the fact that, you know, hard times eventually, because people want their kids to have better than they did, right? Hard times eventually, go through and they create weaker individuals yep. because the people that went through them, right? And then weaker individuals get plowed off and then the strong survive. And again, it, it is that, that circular thing. So, you know, a lot of people can't see the correlation between what we're going through right now to Bolshevism when it was coming into power. They can't see it into Nazism when it was coming into power. They can't compare it to any of the things that happened in China where it's a divide and conquer. And I say this, you know, if you split America into two halves and one was the conservative side, and the other was the liberal side. The liberals literally eat themselves. I mean, I've seen three liberals get in an argument yeah. and couldn't even argue because one wasn't using gender-specific pronouns and the other one was doing something else and this one was prejudiced. And it's like, at the end, I don't even know what you idiots wanted. Did you guys need a pencil? You know, yeah. was it a marker? What was the problem? <laughs> you, know what I mean? you said it was red and you think it's blue? Great. You know what I mean? Let's change everything up again. So, uh, it, it's really problematic and you end up with these kids and, and you know, they, they, uh, it's like, it's, it's even worse than beta males. When they get a job, they don't Wait a minute, there's something worse than beta males? There is. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. all right. And, and it's the C males, and it's the C-U-N-T males that I call afterwards that come into it. And that's the majority <laughs> of what I'm seeing now. And so when they get a job and they finally go somewhere, because again, they're not good at the male things that were established. They're not good at sports maybe. They're not good at other things. And so the easiest thing to do is to say, well, I don't want to be a part of that. It's like the little fat kid whose dad is a soccer coach, right? Well, he's a little barrel ass, and he sucks at all the kicks, and his teammates want to beat him up while they're drinking Capri Suns after the games because he just <laughs> lost the damn game, right? So it's one of two things you can do. You can start working out and get off your ass and like work towards becoming better at kicking field goals and whatever else, or you can sit on the couch and keep doing what you're doing and enjoy those Capri Suns and three fruit roll-ups in addition to it, and then tell everybody that you don't care about that. Right. Because what's easiest to do? Well, well, I never cared about those things. It's like you meet people that financially haven't made good decisions. Oh, I never cared about finances. Maybe you just suck at it. Well, like, we've, like we've been saying, I mean, with these kids getting these participation trophies, they don't understand there is no substitute for hard work. And it's, you know. How could they? And when they go to their jobs, they don't understand why their supervisor is not coming to them every 30 minutes and patting them on the back the way that their parents did. And right. it's like the proof that you are doing a decent job is the fact that somebody's paying you to still sit in that chair and be there. That's the proof. Not because your dad is coming around and telling you, oh, great job, or your supervisor or whatever else, right? And then they come home and, well, I don't feel appreciated. Right. Well, so, like we said in the beginning, it's just, this generation just isn't very solution-oriented. It's very... Things, I, have been, I, things have been done for them. I saw the video of this little fat fucking kid. Like, Mom, I'm, you know, the new whatever came out. I got the dopest one. This is probably a couple hundred, or, you know, thousand dollars. I need the newest one. She's like, no. And she's like, he's like, Mom, come out back. And she literally takes the phone, watch this, Mom, and throws it in the fucking pool. This little piece of shit. And then he, she's like, go get the goddamn phone. Or, and, she, and he goes and swims and gets it. And then he takes it and throws it on the cement. And the mom, I don't know if she wound up getting him a phone or not again. I'm sure she probably did. But, like, this is what this little fucker's attitude was. I'm so entitled. I deserve the next phone. Even this one, it's $1,000. My or kid would have got five the... hours in a closet. Dude. <laughs> but that's, that's, you know, like I said, some of the, some of the worst things these kids have to go through. That's when you buy him a flip phone and go, there right. you know, we, we have a saying in Polish, make sure you don't raise your kids so that, you know, they don't end up bringing you water on a fork. Right? Yeah. When you're in, in, you know, in your bed and you're infirm and whatever else and stuff like that, and it's like that's that's really the I think the culmination of whether you are able to die or be on a deathbed and, and provided you know still have the luxury of knowing when you're going to die and, and, and make amends and everything and put things in order in your life. So say that in Polish. 
e, wychowaj swoje dzieci, żeby nie podali ci wody na widelcu. So make sure you raise your kids in a way that they don't bring you water on a fork. On a fork, basically, yeah. right? Don't raise life, idiots. Right. Don't raise idiots and, and raise people that have a level of respect. And of course, you know, this started with the whole feminist movement. When, you, when I look at, at a lot of feminism, it hasn't made things better for women. It's made things worse for everybody. And it attacked specifically the black community in the 60s and 70s. And it basically went through there and it said, look, you know, you can do just as well without a man. You can do even better, right? So you have right now about 67% of black households that are fatherless, right? And then we know that if you're fatherless, it's like six times higher to end up in prison, six times higher to like, you know, commit suicide, all these other things that come with that. And of course, when that's what you grow up with and that's the norm, well, if you grow up with just a mom, well, you don't have respect maybe for authority, right? right? And maybe you didn't get that belt on your ass that maybe you should have gotten a couple times in your life and you didn't get that instant check. Well, guess what? What the world's going to do to you in the long run is going to be far worse than getting a pat on yeah. your ass when you're three yeah. or four yeah. or five yeah. years yeah. old, right? That's the thing. That's right. that's where the, the, the bullshit of, um, you know, uh, people getting charged for spanking their kids, you know, right. and all this other stuff. And something that, you know, moms have come to me for years and said, you know, uh, little Jimmy wants to go out for wrestling, but I don't want him to get hurt. And I go, well, what's the alternative? He's, he's an aggressive kid. He's obviously got testosterone. Right. He's a rough, rough and tumble type of kid. So what's the alternative where his aggression is going to end up hanging out with the wrong kids, doing dope, uh, ending up in prison, ending up dead, you How know, you addicted. Yeah. yeah. And so I would, go, you know, it's like uh, my daughters. Um, obviously, I didn't have boys. I had three daughters. But, you know, I wanted them involved in sports. You know, they were incredible swimmers, both very hard workers, very disciplined, very disciplined in school. And now my oldest daughter, uh, who's a rower, has got a scholarship to go to a D1 school for rowing because of her work ethic. That's the type of kids that, and I told them from literally like age seven, I said to my kids, I'm not going to pay for your college. You better figure out a way to get it done. And that's great grades and be good at sports. Or military. And, and get it yeah. paid for. Or yeah. The, yeah. And so, um, you know, obviously... I would have taken out loans or whatever I got to do to pay for it. I don't want my kids to hear this. <laughs> but, but my oldest daughter has done it on her own. My sophomore, going to be a junior, is doing it on her own. And my six-year-old will do it also, right? They will bust their asses and they will get it done on their own because when they walk away with that degree, they can say, I did this. I'm the one that accomplished this. Nobody gave me shit. I earned it, right? And that's going to make them different compared to the other kids. They're the reason. They're going to end up CEOs and running companies or doctors or attorneys kicking ass in life where people who have raised these kids the way they have to give them everything, um, it's it's going to be a disadvantage to their kids. Well, let's, I, like I said in the beginning, they just appreciate it more when they work for it. Absolutely. Right. You have to pay back for it. I've often thought that the standard, for example, let's say we use the the, the, the amount of $100,000 should be the standard. And, uh, you know, if your parents make $35,000 a year, then maybe for sending a kid to college, you should pay 35 cents on the dollar. You should pay something and not just be granted it. Sure. And the reason being is then when you have those kids that go to school and, for example, they might end up with, you know, 30 grand of loans instead of $120,000, they pay that off. Hopefully in the next generation, they're the ones making the $100,000, right? right? And they're the one then paying full price instead of just giving it to people. But not everybody's cut out for college, right? That's no, the problem and, and of you today. Don't have to be. That's, That's the problem. problem. That's right. the problem of today is that right. everybody thinks that their kids should be in, in college, right? right? And that's not the way it is. I mean, we need welders. We need people that, that do other things Absolutely. that have other skills and you know I was going to college for a while and my mom got sick with heart problems I went home and took care of her and that's why I started fighting professionally but to be honest with you I think it worked out the way it was supposed to because I hated school I absolutely mm. hated it I loved history I loved researching I loved you know that sort of stuff and getting into it but the rest of it I just saw you know my oldest brother who quit school as a uh, I think he was a before his junior year he was 16 Moved in with a 32-year-old beautiful blonde, um, and he was 6'4", six, 6'5", six, you know, flowing black hair, you know, looked like Burt Reynolds, but, but twice his height. And, uh, uh, but, but he became a multimillionaire by the time he was 23 without a college ed or without a high school education. And so, you know, you don't need it. You really don't well, need look it. look at the people that, that we, you know, we talk about in America, the fact that it's old money that trickles down. And quite honestly, in America, it lasts about three generations. And usually what you see is the immigrants come here, the people come here, they work hard. And, uh, you know, the second generation has an easier life. And the third generation, they give them the easy life without the work ethic. And they, you know, are the ones that get into drugs and whatever else. The people today that have made it, that we know, from Zuckerberg, like, you don't name some people, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, none of these people came from money. Ah, right? Gates did. Gates did? <laughs> oh, dude, you look into Gates' family, right. they're old school money. And even the guy that um, basically 
distributed Microsoft. It was on behalf of his parents, and it was Gates taking money of open source software. You should watch uh, uh, James Corbett has a two now no it's a three part series on Gates, and he shows you his origins. But we're talking about you. 1800s, late, early 1900s eugenicist money. Like, he was on the board Who there. Who was the Berkshire Hathaway guy? That's uh, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. Okay. Yeah. Yes. He didn't. He no, had you're right. machines when he was younger. Yeah. Yep. The guys that owned Google, they didn't. Sure. Zuckerberg didn't, right? So maybe you're talking about 10% out of the people that I, might have I would money. say you're right. I mean, I, listen, I would say that the, the majority of people... The majority. No. If, it was, if it was just old money that trickled down in America, the only people with, with it today would be ex-slave owners. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which yeah, is not there. Yeah. Anderson Cooper you have, he's a Vanderbilt, right? Uh-huh. Yes, he didn't he get shit out of that. You know? He didn't well. get anything out of that. He's got a university He got, he got the child abuse, I guess. Hopefully, a manifested in him being a shitty broadcaster, right? Oh, hey, a lot of people say he might be CIA is all I'm going to say. You okay, know, so I got a, oh, oh. Oh, wait, we got a question from uh, uh, Nate Schultz says, uh, just curious, how would you handle this situation, not just dealing with how life-threatening COVID, quote, quote unquote, life-threatening COVID is, but also life-altering, and the mass hysteria that sweeps the nation, uh, people are already crazy and on edge. I think I think the effective plans set in place by the states are to ease the mind and give off a safe feeling. I'm not sure everything is a Watergate conspiracy. All right. Can I address that really quickly? Yeah, please do. So the first thing that they told you is we need to get testing, right? We need to test, 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 test. That's fine. Well, the first thing they told us is lock down and, and steal your freedom. Uh huh. Well, <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. They, when they were starting to roll it out, they're all about testing, right? Okay. So what happens after the testing? What about treatments? No, it was fear, vaccine, lockdown, stay away from other human beings. Maybe we should never shake hands again. Right. Total fear by the establishment. Now, if you've looked at the censorship, and this is something we haven't touched on a lot. We touched on it quick with your Amazon thing. Right. Who's getting censored the most? It's not just Jason Burmis or Alex Jones or Pat Militich. It's actual people with medical degrees. From Dr. Erickson to Dr. Sedell to Buttar, who you talked about, and now you have Dr. Bartlett that's saying uh, budesonide, yet another steroid, because now dextromethasone is the approved steroid they say works, works on this. And we've had doctors out in Dallas say antibiotics works on this. And now vitamin D is a viable treatment where it wasn't in March when people started talking about it. Right. And vitamin C. So what you do is you take away the fear induction and say, hey, there are treatments for this. Okay, and if you get tested early and you start showing symptoms, we're gonna give you these. And whether you want the hydroxychloroquine and the Z-Pak, we're not gonna wait till you're almost on a ventilator to do a study into this, which is what the NIH is, NIH is now doing with Dr. Bartlett's uh, steroid treatment because they don't want success. This has never been about a virus. This is about control. This is about medical martial law. When in history have we ever had it where people are admitted in mass and they are not allowed to have a family member speak on their behalf next to them if they are almost incapacitated. Right. That is insanity to me. Yeah. If I've got my mother on a ventilator and she can't speak, I better fucking be able to speak for her. Absolutely. That is nuts. And if that doesn't alarm you, and that's what they're putting forward, and if you watch this earlier, you go through the Fauci numbers on vaccines, you should understand. This is about control and not the success of a treatment. You know, hydroxychloroquine, even Cuomo said in the very beginning, well, we're hoping it's successful here too. I know the nurses down there. They did not administer that in the beginning. You know, they tried that, what, Re Rev Mesomir, I think, but they, they waited to the very end of that. They sent so many people home just to tough it out. You know what I mean? So let's be honest with people about the treatment. Anybody without insurance can get a uh, budesonide treatment for under $200. Right. That's affordable to almost everybody. And then if you're on Medicaid, Medicare, it's going to take care of it anyway. But they will not promote that stuff because if they did, we'd open up 100% tomorrow. Well, that's what I said to you last night during our little post-fight thing. The, the level, I mean, kids out there, low, get, your, get your law degree because you're going to be busy for the next several years. Whether it's the medical industry, whether it's politicians. You know, the refusal to administer some of these alternative therapies, whether it's hydroxychloroquine or any other ones, and then put them on things that are killing them, they're going to get charged with wrongful death lawsuits. They're going to get tried for possibly genocide, well, medical yeah, think malpractice. About that. The, the, the nurses that were coming on in secret uh, that were getting banned all over social media saying they were watching other nurses and doctors literally deliberately kill patients on respirators because it's your, your lungs fill with fluid, then you put them on a respirator, and it acts like hydraulics and blows their lungs out and kills them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like a death sentence. The minute, like 80% 
of people that got put on respirators died because of it. And I'll say this. Just a, a week ago, the day that Dan Dix got uh, kicked off the internet, Dan Dix, Press for Truth, 14 years, five documentary films, may not agree with him, but I know he's a good guy, okay? I check my YouTube, and the, they take down a video. The first video I've gotten taken down at all nationwide. I've had some get blocked in a country or two, or there's one where you dare say Erica Caramello Bar's real name. It was actually Louis Go Gomer, and that got blocked after being remonetized. Shows you the system works. Right. <laughs> Cameron Sedell is a doctor down in New York City. Now, he was the first doctor to talk about, and I had already talked about it because my nurses were telling me this, that 70 to 90% of the people going on ventilators down there were dying. So Cameron Sedell goes on there and says, I'm treating these patients, but if we keep using these ventilators like they are, we're going to kill a lot of people. This is April 5th. My video got taken down. His source video, he is a medical professional, got taken down. Within a week of him going viral, the New York Times did a story on him and the ventilators and actually did a video piece, which they rarely do. Now, that's still an authoritative source. That video is still up there. But the raw video of a doctor being the first to warn the public about the use of these ventilators and the death rates is somehow being censored by the technocrats at the top on the second largest search engine in the world that's owned by the first largest search engine in the world. Of course, I'm uh, referring to YouTube and Google. And to me, you know, an organization that pays no taxes and is in bed with the government on multiple levels, NASA in particular, in quantum computing and artificial intelligence, that's not a utility, that's not a corporation, that is an arm of the media, military, industrial complex that brainwashes us daily. If, if I can touch on this also, uh, I compare what goes on in America to, you know, that boogeyman you hear of when you're five or six years old that wants to come and offer you candy before he abducts you from the park, right? People know that George Soros sends money to the United States. Do you think he does it, like you get to the why, right? Does he do it for the betterment of America, right? right? With all the millions and all the other things, I mean, there's people that are starving in this world, there's slavery, that there's an open slave market, there's child trafficking in this world, right? There's all these things that are going on that money could be put towards. There's, you know, to put on how much better we live than the rest of the world, I think there's something like around 800,000 people a year that die of, and maybe even over a million, that die of diarrhea. Diarrhea, right? The same thing that you go and you have a sweaty taco, you shit your brains out, and then you drink a, a, a cup of, taco. and you eat that same sweaty taco 30 minutes later, right? People die of in this world, mm -hmm. right? So we haven't solved that, and we haven't fixed that, and it's not in their financial interest to be able to do that. You cannot financially incentivize hospitals to give people positive COVID-19, like, you know, outcomes that that's what they die from. Mm -hmm. Why would you pay people money, and who is paying that money? Exactly. Yeah. What's the goal behind that? And ultimately in America, if you had real news and real media, it wouldn't be conservative and it wouldn't be liberal. It would just be news. Sure. But they don't do that here. They, they create the problem, then they create the solution, and then they do the fear mongering before. And you see it everywhere that they do it. And it's like, you know, at 9 a.m., the, the, the newscasters go out there and, and, you know, it's like, your refrigerator, how what you don't know might be killing you. And now you've got old people at house at their homes shaking, afraid to eat a damn salad and take their medications till 5 p.m. when the damn news goes on, right? Right. And there's no liability with anything. It's basically anybody can say whatever they want to, but then you have to ask again, who is that governing body that's deleting these videos? Mm -hmm. And somebody along the line has to come up who is more about the freedom of speech and allowing videos to go out there that's not going to censor these things. Well, I hope so, but you talked about problem, reaction, solution, and you talked about diarrhea, so I'm going to combine those, all right? So you look at the problem of malaria globally right and somebody comes in like bill gates and the reaction is we got to do something now bill gates he's got billions sure sounds like you should probably just make running water and a sewage system for these people and that'll solve about 90 percent of it no nope, gmo mosquitoes yeah. we're going to make gmo mosquitoes we're going to release them in third world countries that's going to solve the malaria problem and the reaction to the public is awesome that's a thank you yeah. so now we have the release of those same GMO mosquitoes with a different uh, flavor for malaria being released in Florida and Houston over the next two years. What are we doing when we are messing with the genetic nature of something that we all get bit by right. to protect us from something that almost nobody gets here because we do have water systems, sewage, good food, access to medicine, 
things that we don't need yet that's the solution so why are these unaccountable billionaires as you hinted on taking over my state he's put Cuomo has put what Bloomberg in charge of contact tracing over 3,000 people have been uh, hired on that Joe Biden says he wants a hundred thousand and he wants it for COVID 1984 and other health conditions who do he put in charge of education to reimagine it the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation hell let's throw Eric Schmidt in there for good measure to Eric reimagine. Schmidt. Wait, the Eric Schmidt that ran the Clinton the Clinton initiative? Oh, that's the guy. He's oh. listen, he also has a book called The New Digital Age with Jared Cohen, member of the CFR. For those that aren't familiar with Eric Schmidt, Eric Schmidt is Council of Foreign Relations. Yeah, CEO of Google's uh, Bilderberg steering member. I mean, as powerful as you get. After, you know, he got caught up in the Me Too stuff, you didn't hear a lot about it, but people made some accusations. He moved from Google to be an advisor in Alphabet, and then he just kind of left altogether. Sure he did. He's the guy that promoted the Dragonfly censored internet infrastructure for China and then defended it on television. Why is he involved with my country at all? Yeah, buddy. Oh. I, I think it's a similar phenomenon that happens. When you, for example, you're part of a jury. And I don't know if you guys have ever had the pleasure of doing that, right? Thank God. By the way, there's a, such a thing called jury nullification, which is one of the most wonderful tools that very few people know about, which basically says that you can go in there and say, yeah, I understand this person's guilty of murder, but I don't want to try him, so you know, I'm nullifying you know, that whole sense, and you have the ability to do that. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of people that walk into a courtroom, they see somebody dressed in orange, and the initial thought deep down is, well, if this person wasn't guilty, they wouldn't be here in front of me dressed in orange. And I think a lot of people tend to look at somebody like Bill Gates, and it's like, well, this guy's a master at computers. Well, he should know everything then, right? And, you know, something should tell you. It's like, well, it doesn't mean that, you know, Michael Jordan would be great on a bobsled team, right? right? right. Wasn't great and, at baseball. Well, wasn't great <laughs> at baseball, right? And it doesn't mean that he'd be a phenomenal chef. And, you know, there, there's other people I know, and they're great dancers and, like, you know, I mean, great on stage dancers. And I went hiking with them, and it's like they had terrible balance and didn't ride a bike well. And it's like, how the hell does that work, right? That's and amazing. so there's this thing that we hold these people in high regard that it's like, well, you know, if you're good at this, then, you know, if you're a great fighter, for example, well, you must be wonderful in philosophy and you can probably tear a roof off a house. And, you know, you might know how to work out in cars and all these other sorts of things. And, and that's just not the case, right? Right. And so this guy, it's like stick to the damn software, right. you know what I mean? And stick to other sorts of things. And if you want to put money towards something, again, put it towards clean water. Put it towards teaching people how to, you know, uh, move around and be able to grow their own food. I was really impressed with Haiti. We had people in 2010. At the time, I was with the Combat Camera Squadron in Charleston, South Carolina. They went down there and filmed parts of Haiti. And when they came back, a lot of them had to literally burn all their clothes because the smell of death had permeated everything. They would take a bath and it would come out of oils, right? Jeez. And it just sticks there. And uh, by the way, my, my best friend, uh, about two and a half uh, years ago now, committed suicide in my house and I found him after a week, right? Oh my God. Uh, after a, a damn week, right? And so, and, and uh, you know, these situations happen. And, and uh, I, I touch on that in the film 22, by the way, if anybody's interested in seeing that. But um, people have that where they just go through and then also... Bill Gates has been around so many yes people. It's like you think of the Elvis Presley's and the Michael Jackson's where it's like you can do no wrong because everybody around you, you know, you're a multi-billionaire so you can get away with all these sorts of things. never accountable, but true friends. Why would you? You know, yeah. if something failed, who cares? you got 10 other businesses that are doing well and whatever else and the people you have around you, they're not going to tell you no or whatever else. So it's like, you know, what qualifications does this guy have to do anywhere? Right. And if you want to start doing it and everything like that, okay, you know, show me an example of something and, and I've said this even with, with anything. It's like, we have 50 states in America. We should be able to come up with solutions 50 times faster than any other country. Mm. You want to try socialized medicine? Do it in a state. Try it in Mississippi. Try it in Alabama. Try it where some people vote for it, right? I mean, like I said before, one and thing don't I depend know, on the rest of the country to bail your ass out when it yeah, fails. Yeah, mm -hmm. when it fails. We, if we went to that system and, and you know, you're paying, like Denmark, some of these countries, $3.25 for a can of Coke out of the store, not at a restaurant, out of a store, mm. right? Well, your health probably would improve because you can no longer afford to be a barrel ass, you know? Right. Because that, that yeah. 140 ounce, you know, or whatever they have there, you know, those big gulps that cost 99 cents, that's 28 bucks now. You know what I mean? You're going to do that or you're going to eat? You're going to spend 800 bucks a month on Coca-Cola? Right. Right? You better be rich to be a fat fuck now, right? Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Ideally. Oh. I don't know. I know you said you had to go. I do. I got to hit the road, man. I got to drive back to St. Louis. I mean, I guess, you know, we've probably been going for over an hour. It kicked off a lot. But, guys, don't worry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to re-upload the whole thing in high definition. I'll premiere it later today. I can't thank you enough, Pat. No, thank you, Jason. Listen, this is awesome, buddy. You no, know, you rock. And, listen, how do, you, how do we motivate more people to be like you? Because, listen, 
you're a championship athlete. You've trained other championship athletes. Those guys showed up out of loyalty to you yesterday. I mean, Hughes was there. Sylvia was there. You've built things, but then you've gone beyond that. And you've used your notoriety now to do a great thing for the community, to show people that they can get together, that they can join with one another, that it's not, you know, this racial divide isn't real in America. Right. Not the way they're saying. That doesn't mean racism doesn't exist, but especially in our generation, we're all in our 40s and 50s here, I assume, yeah. it's gotten so much better. I've seen it go right, better, right, right. and it should. You know, so many of us are part of mixed families and don't look at color. We look at the content of people's character. And when somebody like Bobby Green wins an MMA fight, and says that, brings his white father over and says, I judge no man by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. And yeah. Twitter censors that. Right. That's 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 now, wow. con yeah, they censor that as sensitive content. We are in an alarming state. So how do we get people to take what you've built? Like, you know, someone's good at business, someone's an athlete. How do we get them to get out there and expand that to the community so we can fight this COVID-1984? Starvation. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Uh -huh. Because when their refrigerator's empty... They'll get motivated. If the government isn't paying them, the government has to stop paying them, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually, which is going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Eventually, we're going to get to the point where the rubber's going to meet the road. Um, the dollar's dead. Uh, we're going to get to a point where uh, that potentially could happen. And I think that that, for me, uh, being passionate about what I was doing, mm -hmm. um, having that goal of winning the world title, having the goal of training other world champions and helping other people realize their dreams... Ultimately, a good friend of mine who's in hospice now, who's not afraid to die at all, he says, I know where I'm going, I'm, I'm not afraid at all, uh, said, you know what the secret of life is, and what the, what the, what, what the reason of life is, what the being, being here is all about. And I said, what? To serve others, to help others. So society is so selfish now that they only serve themselves, and that's, that's all they look out for, is themselves, and eventually that falls apart. It's going to fall apart, because the self-serving... Uh, mentality is, is, is going to collapse upon itself. So it comes down to people waking up and you know what? Yes. Uh, opening the door for someone else. Uh, helping someone across the street. Uh, giving someone a cheeseburger who's starving. You know, anything. Any act of kindness to just help someone else has to start happening more and more and more because government benevolence does not exist. You, you, you have to understand that government has no money. We're the people that have the money. They steal it from us, and then give it out to other people to vote a certain <laughs> way. So they're, they're, you know, so it, it's going to come down to things are going to get a lot worse than they get better when they uh, before they get better. Is unfortunately the way it's going to be. So two nights ago, I was at the hotel in, in uh, Davenport, and um, I it was the first night I was here, and I went back after a meeting with Matt Hughes and, and having dinner uh, with him and his friends, and. Um, I got out of my car and as I'm walking to the front, three people were walking by and I heard, overheard them talk about how they hate white people and they also don't like Mexicans and I heard that. And uh, so me being mean, you know, not because I like confrontation, but I went up to them and I asked them for a lighter and we started talking and everything like that. And uh, we probably talked for 15 or 20 minutes. So, you know, I finished smoking and we still talked. We talked about a lot of different things that were going on politically and whatever else. And, you know, the, the very next morning, I'm coming down, uh, getting ready to, to travel to the uh, fairgrounds and uh, just see where the ring is set up and where I'm gonna be filming at and whatever else. And they happen to be there in the lobby and they invited me to have coffee with them, right? And so I'm not saying necessarily that they like me, but I'm pretty sure they don't hate me. And the point is how you defeat racism is not sitting there waiting for different policies or erasing historical facts that, that have happened. <coughs> if anything, we should look at that as sort of a barometer on how far we've just come from those sorts of things. The way that you do it is engaging with people and finding a level of commonality and being able to go through those things that make you uncomfortable and willing to be able to talk about them. That's how you make a, you know, a different impact, sure. right? Um, and so, and I, and I think that's a challenge for everybody on the individual basis because ultimately it's like be the change that you want to see, not try to force other people into being the change, you be the change. Absolutely. Right? Luca, why don't you tell people where they can find your stuff? Uh, my stuff, I mean, I've got five films right now that are on Amazon, right? If, if they uh, just search my name, if you put in the credit, you can you can basically uh, look at my films that are on there. The film that got banned, uh, Sag and Addict, which I'm happy to say is now on uh, Google Play, and I think you can get it off of YouTube. Before enough people watch and you know, also complain, they'll get banned again. And, you know, who knows? Maybe in another, like, five, ten years, we'll be going to China because of, you know, their freedoms that they have out there. Scary. Or Saudi Arabia, maybe Dubai, right, yeah. is where we'll have to go. Because it will not. not have caught up yet. I mean, it's a hell of a thing to think about. How much things have changed when you think about going to Moscow to have more freedoms than here? Right. Yeah, buddy. Jeffrey, 
Tell people where they can find your stuff. Uh, the Conspiracy Farm, of course, theconspiracyfarm.com. I'm on Twitter at I'm Jeffrey Wilson. That's E R Y. I'm on Instagram at J Michael Will. And, you know, JFK said it best, man, in the final analysis we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Like you said, none of us beat the Grim Reaper, man. We have way more in common than we do different. You know, stop falling for the okie doke, man. Live your life. Get busy living or get busy dying. That's right. They're 100 billion and oh. We all go. Guys, this has been awesome. I can't I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed the past couple of days. Hey, I guess I'm supposed to quarantine myself because I am so damn free. Mm-hmm. That's probably why. <laughs> I mean, that's, how, that's what it feels like. They don't want you to look at the rest of the country. Remember, my governor has literally taken 19 states more than half the geographic population of 320 million people and said, no, you can't go see those people. And I refuse to live that way. You should too. Yeah. Period. We got to fight back today, guys. I love you, and I'll see you on the flip side. Peace. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you guys jumping on.